you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. My name is Nathan. I'm the lead pastor here at Ridgeline and so excited to be with you today as we continue this series. And I just want to say, uh, let's give a huge shout out to our worship team. Didn't they do an amazing job this morning? Uh, they did an amazing job. And let me just say, like our worship team, they're, they're very talented, uh, but also they put a lot of time in. And so I'm trying not to make them sound less talented by saying they put a lot of hours in to make it sound that good. It's not because they're not talented, it's because they want to they wanna do it with excellence. And so they're both talented and they put a lot of uh, time into all of this. Now, one of the things that I'm excited about that we announced last week that's going to be launching with our small group semester in a couple of weeks is our Ridgeline School of Ministry. And I'm really, really excited about this and really pumped. We've got uh, three or four people signed up already, and I know the Lord is convicting several others of you to, to do this and to be a part of this. And we will be doing uh, some of the classes at a university level, and it'll be a cohort that will meet a couple of times a week, or a couple of times a month, sorry, not a week, a couple of times a month. Uh, it'll be a cohort that we get together, and we go through the Ridgeline ordination process uh, together, uh, but also like you'll be well on your way to a theology degree by the time you're through a lot of this. But it'd be a lot of spiritual growth in here as well. We'll be doing small groups together. We'll be doing, it, it's, it's, it's amazing. So if you're interested in that, make sure you sign up on our central hub, ridgelineashville.com. So the first Sunday of the month, we started this new series called Best Year Yet, starting the year off right. Because a great year starts with good disciplines. And regardless of what happens this year, we can be at our best through the power of the Holy Spirit. I think last year we learned a lot about uh, what we have control over and what we don't have control over. But some of the most important things uh, that, that uh, regardless of what happened last year, some of your most important things to steward, you still had control over. You still were able to control and how, what your attitude was like, how you treated those around you, whether or not you were a beacon of fear or a beacon of hope, whether or not you shared the gospel, what, um, you know, the words that you spoke, the, the, the meditations of your heart and the way that you allowed yourself to think, all of those things, regardless of how terrible last year was, and it was pretty rough on a lot of people, you still had all of that at your disposal. You still had control over all of those things. And so throughout this series, we've been looking at spiritual disciplines that are to be a part of the life, uh, the, the life of a follower of Jesus. Now, let me just say it like this. We don't do these spiritual disciplines out of some sort of obligation to check off some sort of spiritual box or our spiritual journal or our spiritual checklist every day. We do these with, through the power of the Holy Spirit. We, these are ways for us to connect with our Heavenly Father.
And so I'm excited as we continue this series today. So I believe, as we get into it, I believe that worship, worship is to be a part of our everyday life. And so today I want to look at the spiritual discipline of praise and worship. And now throughout this today, as a talk, I'm going to use the words praise or worship interchangeably. I know that technically uh, and scripturally, there is some somewhat of a difference between, um, you know, the difference between praise and the difference between worship. But we're gonna, I want to, I want to kind of, I'm just going to use these interchangeably for the. It just means, you know, our, our our time of adoration towards the Father or whatever. But we'll get into it. And so I believe that worship is to be a part of our everyday life. And there is this great portion of scripture um, that that we look that I just want to read in just a moment Ezekiel chapter 37 and so uh, it's it's found in Ezekiel 37 we're going to start in verse 1 and now I understand that this portion of scripture in context is not about praise and worship it's about prophecy and and I get that and yet I think there are some great spiritual parallels uh, for us that we can find with a lifestyle of worship or what it means to worship or why we worship and, and those types of things. And so th- there's this great portion of scripture. Well, it's, it, it's about declaring things. And I believe there's some amazing parallels to the power that we find in worship. So let's start Ezekiel chapter 37. We're going to start in verse one. I'm going to read a lot. So I'm going to try to read quickly. And uh, my quick would be about your average. So here we go. The hand of the Lord was on me. This is Ezekiel. He's the prophet speaking. Now, we know the role of the prophet is especially well-defined in the Old Testament is to speak to the people on behalf of God, okay? Uh, The priest represented God, uh, represented the people to God. The prophet represented God to the people, okay? And so he's speaking to the people. This is what, uh, this is what he's, or this is what's going on in his life. The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord, and he set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. And he asked me, Son of man, can't these bones live? So, Ezekiel. I imagine he's in a vision or something. He's in a vision, I believe. And and so God shows him, takes him to a valley of dry bones, places him in the middle, and there's all these bones everywhere. It's dead. Like, there's dead stuff, right? It's it's bones. They're not alive. They're dead. And so he asks them, son of man, can these bones live? Ezekiel, do you think this can live? Ezekiel gives the best answer you probably could give when God asks a question. I said, sovereign Lord, you alone know. That's what you, when you don't know the answer, well, you, you know, I mean, you're God, you, you know. And so he continues. Here's what he says in verse four. He says, then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. I love that. Dry bones as if, as if they have ears, right? As if they have ears. Like that, and that would be weird. I, I have a lot of bones, 200 and something, I'm told. And uh, none of them have ears, okay? But these ones, he's speaking to them as if they do. Hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to those bones. I will make, I will make breath enter you, and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you, and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Verse 7. So I prophesied. As I was commanded, and I was, as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, a rattling sound. There was a sound. He's prophesying, there's a sound. And the bones come together, bone to bone. And I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, uh, but there was no breath in them. Verse 9. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come breathe, come breath from the four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied, and as he commanded me and breathed, uh, breath entered them, they came to life and they stood up on their feet, a vast army. Watch this. Ezekiel, placed in the middle of a whole bunch of dry bones. 
God asks him, hey, Ezekiel, can these live? He says, uh, that's a good question you would know the answer to. And God says, they can. So I want you to begin to speak over these dry bones. And so the dry bones, they come together, tendons, limbs, flesh, and then they're still not really alive, right? They're, 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 they look like people or they look like life, you know, but they're still not alive. So he prophesies again, the breath of God comes and breathes into them. And what, what comes out of it? An army. This is a crazy story. An army. So good. All right. So table all of that. Hope you got it memorized because we're coming back to it. I'm going to get you to recite it. Because we're going to come back to all this at the end because this is worship. So first thing I want you to know about worship. Here, here's the first thing. Worship is a position. Worship is a position. In other words, worship is all about your heart. It's 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 all about your heart. Romans 12 gives us this great definition of worship, and here's what it says. Beloved friends, what should, uh, what should be our proper response to God's marvelous uh, mercies? I encourage you to surrender yourselves to God to be his sacred living sacrifice and live in holiness, holiness experiencing all that, that delights his heart. For this becomes your genuine expression of worship. What's worship? You go back. There we go. Our proper response to God's great mercy. Verse 2. Stop imitating idols and opinions of the culture around you. I love that. Stop imitating idols and, and opinions of the culture around you, but inwardly transformed but be inwardly transformed by the Holy Spirit through a total reformation of how you think. How should we think? (laughs) Way different than culture. Way different than culture. Way different than culture. Way different than culture. In fact, our, our, when it comes to the way that we think and when we come out of the world or we, get to, we, get, we come to know Jesus or whatever, our mind needs a complete reformation. Our mind needs a reformation. This will empower you to discern God's will as you live a beautiful life, satisfying and perfect in his eyes. Oh, that's worship. That's worship. Isaiah 29, what, this is what Isaiah 29 says. The Lord says, these people come near me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is based on merely human rules they have been taught. What's, what's God saying? This is God rebuking the Israelites through the prophet Isaiah. He says, look, I'm so frustrated with these people's worship. They come in. Here would be the modern equivalent. They come in every Sunday. They, they sing about me, and then they go to lunch, and they don't tip their server very well. So frustrating. Because all the restaurants know it's the church crowd, right? All the restaurants know that right about 12, 15, that we've all come from church, right? That, that's kind of this modern equivalent, right? They come in and they worship. They come in, they say the right things, but their lifestyle, their lifestyle doesn't back up what they come in and say at church. Their lifestyle doesn't back up the way that they live. I love this old saying, you know, because uh, I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, and I, I, I pray in the Spirit, and, and, and sometimes people, I see people, they, they use that like a badge of honor, right? I pray in the Spirit. That's fine, but you're mean in English, you know, like, <laughs> let's work on that first. It's a lifestyle. Worship is about the position of our heart. You know, some of my favorite worshipers, some of my absolute favorites, favorite worshipers are, are the least expressive during music times of worship. They're the least expressive. But you can see it on their face, at their heart. Colossians chapter 3. Let every employee, <laughs> this is worship, let every employee listen well and follow the instructions of their employer. Now, some of you are thinking, I know, my employer, but, but Pastor Nathan, my, my employer's an idiot. Okay, 
Paul doesn't put any clauses in this, okay? There are no, if your employer's an idiot, then you have an exception here. If you're, you know, it, what, there's, it's not in here, okay? And so uh, let every employee listen and follow the instructions of their employer, not just when their employee, employers are watching. Oh, I used to do this. And I think I probably, I, and not to, not to, to shift from being under the spotlight of having used to do this, but like, like probably we've all done this, right? Oh, the boss is coming, look busy, right? <laughs> like, yeah. What's that old bumper sticker? Jesus is coming, look busy, right? It's not that, but <laughs> similar. The boss is coming, look busy. We've all probably had those moments or said those things, or and you know, honestly, sometimes it's just your daydream, and then you see your boss, and you go, oh yeah, I should probably, you know, not look like I'm half asleep here as I work. So not just when they're watching and not in pretense, is that right? But faithful in all things. For for we are to live our lives with pure hearts in the constant awe and wonder of our God. Put your heart and soul into every activity that you do. Okay. Now these two things are separate paragraphs, okay? Okay but they're compounding as well. Enthusiastically do your job. Enthusiastically do your job. Enthusiastically do your job. Can you imagine what kind of witness that would be at your work? Can you imagine what kind of opportunities you might have to share the gospel at your work if you got up every day and said, God, thank you for this job. I don't care how much I hate it or how much I don't like my boss. I'm going to do it because this is the job that you've given me in this season, and I don't work for them any way I work for you. And we get up, and we do it with enthusiasm. We do it with, like, man, I love this job. That would be, that would, that would provide so many amazing opportunities to share the gospel. That would be absolutely incredible. And guess what? When you do that, that's worship. So put your heart and soul into every activity you do as though you are doing it for the Lord himself and not merely for others. As though you're doing it for the Lord, not for others. As though you're doing it for the Lord, not for others. Worship is obedience of the heart. Worship is obedience of the heart. Worship isn't just when we come into the room and we sing songs together. That is corporate worship. That is amazing opportunity that we have in a free nation to do on a regular basis. And, and we should never take that for granted because there's lots of, like, like, what that does in our city and what that does in the spirit realm is absolutely incredible. But, but when it comes to just being, like, as a person of worship, we have, we have to understand that worship uh, is obedience of the heart. In fact, for Samuel chapter 15, 22, um, it says uh, Saul, or this is Saul getting in trouble because in the scripture, the, the verse basically goes that to obey, Samuel is correcting him and he says to the king, he says to obey is better than sacrifice. Samuel didn't obey, or, or sorry, King Saul didn't obey and, and he said, but, but, but look, I made a sacrifice. <laughs> We've all seen our kids do that, right? Like, hey, I told you not to make a net. I told you not to make a mess. Yeah, but I made you a cookie. You know, like. That's not a cookie. <laughs> and you're like, but all I really, I didn't want the cookie. What I wanted you to was not to make a mess. And so, so Samuel the prophet gets on to King Saul and he says, to obey is better than sacrifice. And that's, that's how a lot of us think, you know, but I raised my hands in worship. <laughs> to obey is better than sacrifice. Yeah, but I was at church on time. To obey is better than sacrifice. I'm on a serve. T- to obey is better than sacrifice. But don't quit your serve team. Worship is what? It's a position. It's a position of our heart. Whoever I am, whatever stage of my life I'm in, worship is a position of my heart. And I know for some of us we go, yeah, but I'm just, you know, I'm just a stay-at-home mom. And No, listen, worship is a position of my heart. Raising a child in a, for a season is, is an act of worship. Uh, whatever it is you do, I'm just a student in school or in college or whatever. But no, it's a position of your heart and it's a season of your life that you'll never have the opportunity to worship during ever again. 
You have the opportunity to worship. As you go into your classes, you have the opportunity to worship as you change diapers. You have the opportunity to worship as you go day in and day out to school. Number two, here's the second one of two. But don't worry, we're nowhere near the end. <laughs> uh, worship, worship is a declaration. Worship is a declaration. Declarations are all about shifting. Declarations are all about shifting. This is about declaring uh, God's goodness before we see God's goodness. This is about declaring God's goodness before we see God's goodness. Giving thanks before the blessing ever shows up. Giving thanks before we ever get to the breakthrough. I think worship is, is this, it's this uh, position, positioning in, of our heart that says, it doesn't matter what I'm going through right now, I'm going to worship. And it doesn't matter what I'm facing or what's happening right now, what breakthrough I need right now, whether or not there's enough money right now, whether or not you know, I know what my next step's going to be, whatever. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to direct my heart in adoration towards the Father as if I have the answer anyway, because I know He's got them all. He's taking care of it all. And I know that there's, no, there's nothing that I can face on earth that God doesn't already have a solution for, and so I'm just going to worship, and I'm just going to thank the Lord for uh, where I'm at in my life, and I'm going to thank the Lord for my next step, and I'm going to thank the Lord for answered prayers, and I'm going to st- thank the Lord for, for uh, 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 finances and breakthrough, and I'm going to thank the Lord, and, I'm, and, and, it's, and it's a positioning of our heart, but there's also uh, oftentimes when we begin to declare things, there has this shifting there's this, and here's often, t- a lot of times, here's how it works, right? The, the shifting is for us. The shifting is my perspective. The shifting is my mindset. The shifting, it might be my circumstances, but there's usually, there's this shifting. A lot of times, we get into worship, and it puts in perspective the reality of our problems. I remember a little over a year ago, last summer I, was, I had some health issues um, and they got pretty concerning. For those of you that were here at the time, you may remember me preaching with like half a face. Um, I got it back. I got the other half back. It was good. I had Bell's palsy, and um, uh, last summer I had Bell's palsy towards the beginning of the summer, and uh, which is you know it's a weird thing when to lose half of control of half of your face, and but it's not that big of a deal other than it's scary like if you're going through it because this is you know so I had Bell's palsy, and uh, so I went to the doctor and um, excuse me they um, they gave me a prescription and an antibiotic. Um, a couple of, a steroid and an antibiotic. And uh, I remember uh, putting on a lot of weight last year, and that was because of the steroids. So anyway, uh, I started taking the, the medication, and uh, I started taking the medication, and uh, it, it worked. My face went back to normal almost 100%. And, uh, and then the, the round of medication ended, and then um, within a couple of days, the Bell's palsy came back, and it came back worse, and at this time, it affected the nerve. Um, it affected the nerve, uh, the central nerve that controls your eyes. And so my eyes disconnected. And so I, my, I was cross-eyed, right? And it didn't matter. And it was real awkward. I couldn't, I couldn't drive. And, and I couldn't see. Everybody was doubled, right? Like, um, you know, it, Crystal was twice as beautiful, right? It was, you know. It's, but everything was, was double. And everything was, you know, it was just... It, and it was challenging, and, and I, I remember now the doctor is concerned. I go back to my doc, family doctor, you know, that I'd seen the first time, and, and they're concerned now, and they're, now they want me to see a neurologist, and we're, we're doing MRIs, and, and those types of things, and I, rem, I, remember, I remember when uh, I went to the, we got the uh, MRI, went to the neurologist, and the neurologist brings me into her office, and she's going over the results, and she begins to um, bring up, talk about big words like multiple sclerosis and those types of things. 
And I, and I remember kind of going like, uh, as soon as she said multiple sclerosis, I, I didn't, I checked out for the rest of the appointment. I didn't hear anything else. Um, and so later, <laughs> after I left, Crystal called and said, hey, how'd it go? I said, I don't, I have no clue. <laughs> Because she started talking about multiple sclerosis, and I, I didn't hear anything after that. So Crystal had to call and find out what the doctor told me. And so, but I, I got really determined in my spirit. I got really, really determined in my spirit. And I said, all right, I'm not going to whine about this. I'm not going to complain about this. I'm not going to give this any more of a place in my life than it currently has right now. And so I didn't say a word about it, hardly. I mean, I answered anybody's questions, but I didn't say a word. And I drove, I didn't drive, somebody drove me to the house. If I drove home, I, we wouldn't be here today probably, but uh, I wouldn't. Uh, if I, somebody drove me back to the house, I went into the house, I put on some worship music, I probably cried, but I didn't, I, I got intentional in my spirit. And I decided I'm not going to tell God about this problem. I decided I'm not going to, God, you'll never guess the day that I had. You'll never, I mean, Bell, uh, Bell's palsy and now multiple sclerosis. And, and like this is what, you know, people don't live well a lot of times with the, and, and God, I mean, this is a terrible, and wh- how could you let this happen to me? And I, I just, no, I'm not doing that. I didn't talk to God about it at all. What I did do is I, I began to talk to multiple sclerosis. And I said, multiple sclerosis, I just want you to know how small you are in comparison to my God. I want you to know how insignificant you are, how tiny you are, how, how much of a non-problem you are in comparison to how big and how great and how amazing my God is. And I got super intentional in my spirit to say, you know what, I'm I'm not going to allow this problem to compete in size for how big I think God is. See, oftentimes we think that God is barely just bigger than our biggest problem. God is just barely bigger than our biggest problem, when in fact, it's, it's not. In fa- we love the, I love the Mark Batterson quote. It says, to the infinite, to God, the infinite, all finites are equal. Every, every challenge, every problem you could have, you could face, it's all the same. There's not big problems and little problems to God. It's all the same. And when we, when we approach God in worship, we, it's this, there should be this perspective shift. You see, worship shifts our perspective from how big our problem is to how big God is. We go from, man, I can't believe I'm faced with this big, terrible thing that could kill me, to no, uh, multiple sclerosis, you need to understand just how big and how awesome my God is. You need to understand. And it's this command. It's this, it's this we, we, we're declaring things. And I love this. In, in the NIV, uh, the, the, the phrase, praise the Lord, which is kind of this declaration phrase, is said about 185 times. And in the Psalms alone, it's said 96 times. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And most of the, a lot of times it's David. He's declaring things or he's speaking to him, himself. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. I, I'm going to have the right heart and I'm going to have the right perspective. And I'm going to begin to declare some things. And worship shifts us from fear to faith. Worship shifts us from fear to faith. You see, I believe that if I would have begun to pray into my multiple sclerosis and how bad it was, that would not have been building my faith. That would have been allowing fear to take hold. But I didn't. I said, no, I want to tell you about how big my God is. And faith began to rise up in me that I would be okay, that this was not my destiny. This was not going to be how I die. That would probably be at the hands of my wife. But not this. I love worship shifts us from, hey, we can, worship shifts us from, we go from, we can't do anything to God can do anything. We can't do anything to God can do everything. 
I can't do anything. Like, I'm never going to make it through this. I'm never going to get through this situation. This is my lot in life, too. You know, when we begin to worship and we, we begin to direct the affections of our heart towards the Father, it shifts to, you know what? I, I, my, my situation may feel really hopeless right now, but I know God can break through at any moment. I know that he's big enough. I know that he's good enough. I know that he can do anything that he wants. There's this great great story in Elijah, one of the Old Testament prophets, prophets of Baal. He calls, Elijah calls down fire on the mountain. We've been up on this mountain in Israel a couple of years ago, Crystal and I. Um, when we were in Israel, we went up there, and, and uh, what a unique experience and a, a, long, a neat story for another day. But um, in 1 Kings chapter 18, there is this great story about Elijah, and he goes to the prophets of Baal, and he says, hey, why don't we have a God off? Okay, we're going to see your God versus my God. We'll see what's going to happen. You guys make an altar and uh, put some wood on the altar and then um, and, and call down and see if you can get the, the fire from heaven to come down and burn up your altar. And, and then Elijah says, and I'll do the same and, and we'll call down fire from heaven and, and we'll see. And whoever is, uh, whoever, you know, whichever one gets lit on fire will know that's the real one true God. And so here's what, let's, let's read it. First Kings 18. Oh, so this is, okay, I couldn't remember where we picked it up in the story. So the other, uh, the prophets of Baal have already tried, okay, and they're not getting anywhere. In fact, it's taken them like throughout most of the day. And, uh, and then Elijah's been making fun of them like, hey, maybe you're, you should talk louder because maybe your God's on the toilet. Or maybe you should talk louder because maybe he's in deep, uh, deep thought. Which, which is how some translations make that phrase much nicer. Uh, but it's, it's really the real, anyway. Uh, maybe, maybe he's not paying attention. Maybe he's taking a nap. Maybe he says a whole bunch of stuff. And so, at, of course, right, nothing happens. So here's where. Uh, at that time, at the time of the sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, which is uh, Jacob's new name, uh, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and I have done all these things uh, at your command. Answer me, Lord, answer me, so these people will know that you are Lord, uh, you, Lord, are God, and that you are turning their hearts back again. Then, the fire of the Lord fell. I love that. The fire of the Lord fell and burned the sacrifice. The wood, the stones, and the soil, and also licked up all the water in the trench. Oh, yeah. This is this great part, too, where, where uh, Elijah says, have them dump a bunch of water on it. Just, you know, we'll make it a little bit of a challenge. And then they dump water on it like two or three times. In a drought, by the way. And it and it licks up all the water in the trench. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. This caused what? Worship. But what did He do? He made a declaration. Oh, guess what? My God can do. <laughs> guess what? My God can do. Guess what? My God can do. There's this other great story, the, the Hebrew, three Hebrew boys getting thrown into a fiery furnace because they wouldn't pray to, um, they wouldn't uh, pray to a, the golden statue of uh, King Nebuchadnezzar. So it's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they get thrown in. And so uh, let's look at Daniel 3 real quick. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we were not, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. Right? So they wouldn't bow down. And this, well, punishment is fiery furnace. They said, we don't need to defend ourselves. If, um, if we are thrown into a blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us. They're making a declaration. The God we serve, able to deliver us. They're declaring the goodness of the Lord. God is able. The God we serve is able to deliver us. And he will deliver us. They're making this, de listen, we don't just believe God can, we believe that he's good. We believe that he will. We believe that he's incredible and he's amazing and he loves his children and therefore we're going to see his goodness play out in this situation. Um, uh, he deliver us 
from your majesty's hand, but even if he does not. Now, a lot of, say, are they, a lot of people would think, uh, are they taking a step back from, okay, God can, God will, but it, even if he doesn't? No, they're making a, a third step forward that says, we don't understand the plans of the Lord 100% of the time, and sometimes bad things still happen to good people, and, sometimes, and, and, and yet if we're going to go out, we're going to go out celebrating his goodness anyway. We're going to go out declaring his goodness anyway. We're going to go out, go out declaring that, you know what, our God is an amazing amazing God, and, and even if it doesn't work the way we hope it does, the way we want it to, that's okay too, because God's still so good. They're not taking a step back from what they just declared. They're leaning into God's providence. But even if he doesn't, we want you to know, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. We're not going to serve you. Doesn't, we don't care how this plays out. We're not serving this idol. God can. God will. I think probably the better way to, to say this would be God can, God will. And we don't care. God can, God will, and we don't care. It was a declaration. They were making a declaration from their hearts. And I think as a church or as people... Who, who have the opportunity to live a, a lifestyle of worship and, a, and have worship be a part of your, your daily kind of process or your, your regular process of getting to know uh, the Father, your spiritual disciplines, uh, 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 having it be a part of that. We, we still position our, ourselves in a way that says, it doesn't matter what's going on in my life, I'm going to worship. It doesn't matter uh, if I'm filled with doubt, I'm going to worship. And it doesn't matter uh, when I don't know the answer, to, uh, I'm going to worship with my life. It doesn't matter what's going on around me. It doesn't matter what's going on in my world. I believe that God can, God will. He's going to take care of it. There's no solution that he doesn't already know or have, and there's nothing I can face that, that is going to just be a surprise to him. And so I'm leaning into who he is. I, I'm positioning my heart, and I'm making declarations about how good God is. That's worship. I'm positioning my heart, and I'm making declarations. I'm positioning my heart, and I'm making declarations. I'm positioning my heart, and I'm making declarations. And here's some great declarations for you. I love this, that I am a child of God, that I have been healed, that I, am, that I have eternal life, that I've been given peace, that I am clean, that I am Christ's friend, that I am, a cho- that I am chosen and appointed by Christ to bear his fruit, that I have been justified, completely forgiven, and made righteous. I am a slave of righteousness. Some of us don't understand. You are a slave of righteousness. You're not prone to sin anymore as a follower of Jesus. You're prone to righteousness now as you you lean in and draw closer to the Lord. You're not enslaved to the way that you used to live. You're a new creation in Christ Jesus. Now, instead of the way I used to lean into unrighteousness, now I lean into righteousness. I'm a slave of righteousness. I am free forever from condemnation. I am a son or a daughter of of God. God is spiritually my father. I am a joint heir with Christ, sharing in his inheritance with him. I am more than a conqueror through Christ who loves me. I have faith. See, some of us say, well, I just don't have the faith to believe that. Well, according to Romans chapter 12, you do. You do. Lean in. Lean in. Lean in. Begin to declare some things. I have faith. I have been given the mind of Christ. I am a temple, a dwelling place of God. His Holy Spirit and His life dwells in me. I am called. I'm victorious through Jesus Christ. I am being changed into the likeness of Christ. I am a new creation. I am reconciled to God and am a minister of reconciliation. I'm given strength uh, in exchange for weakness. 
I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The life I have, the life I am now living is Christ's life. I am a saint. Some of us feel like, oh man, I'm just so dirty. I've done some terrible things in my life. No, you are a saint, scripture says. You are a saint. You have been blessed with every spiritual blessing. I was chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and without blame before him. I have been raised up and seated with Christ in the heavenlies. I have direct access to God through the Spirit. I am a citizen of heaven, seated in the heavenly round, uh, uh, in heaven right now. I am capable. I am capable. I am capable. Some of us go through life feeling so uncapable. Scripture says you are capable. You can. You can. You can. I am blameless and free from accusation. I am chosen of God, holy and dearly loved. I have been given a spirit of power, love, and self-discipline. I am a member of a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. I have been given ex- expediently, ex- what? exceedingly great and precious promises by God, uh, which I am partaker of God's divine nature. I am forgiven on the account of Jesus' name. I am anointed by God. I am a child of God. And I will resemble Christ when he returns. Ah, I love that. I'm a child of God. And when Jesus comes back, I'm going to resemble him. I'm going to look like him. I'm going to look more and more like Jesus as I lean in. I am loved. I am like Christ. I have life. I am born of God. And the evil one, the devil, cannot touch me. I have been redeemed. These are some declarations. And with the confidence of the word of God, we can do like Ezekiel in in Ezekiel 37. And and we can worship and in declaring the goodness of God over our situation, regardless of how bad it looks, regardless of how dead everything is around us, regardless of the the dry bones or or, or, or what's what's happening or how how, uh, it looks like it's desolate. We can get into whatever that situation is, whether it be a desolate work situation or a desolate family situation a desolate financial situation, a desolate child-parent situation, whatever is going on, we have the right to go into that situation and start to speak to dry bones and say, we declare life over these dry bones. We declare God's goodness over these dry bones. We position ourselves. We position ourselves even before we see the answer that we're going to begin to praise and we're going to begin to worship and we're going to begin to sing. We're going to begin to declare anyway. We're going to say, regardless of what it looks like, we're going to go anyway. I don't need to have experienced the breakthrough to praise God for the breakthrough. I don't need to have experienced a blessing or to thank God for the blessing. In fact, a lot of times it's in the declaration that we make in worship that the shift happens. Either in our selves or in our circumstances. Let's pray.